may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the South. <laughs> Matter of fact, how many, one more time, how many people do we have here tonight? In, in all the buildings, when you hear me say this, please raise your hand in all the overflow buildings. But how many of you are here again for the first time tonight? Let me see your hand. Goodness gracious. Stand up. You're here for the first time. Stand up. Wow. Wow. Hang on. Hang on. Keep standing. How many of you are here last night or tonight for the first time? Let me see you. Would you stand, please? God bless you. That's most everybody. As you can tell, you can be seated. As you can tell, if everybody came from Brownsville Assembly, there wouldn't be anywhere for anybody else to be, would there? So our people... Uh, sporadically comes during the week. We have services Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so they uh, pace themselves and they come different times in the week uh, so that everybody here can get a seat. I think tonight is the largest crowd that we've ever had in the whole revival. <clears throat> now, let me tell you, we've had... Uh, We've had, some, we've had some real good, strong crowds in the revival, but tonight uh, this building is completely full. Our chapel across the street, it houses about uh, 1,000 people, the chapel. And then back at the cafeteria, it will accommodate about 400 people. The choir room will accommodate about 200 people. And then tonight we have a, a small television set up in the WM room, gathering room. And then there's people standing all in the halls back in the back. They can't get in anywhere else. And, you know, God bless you folks. It's good to have you with us. How many of you are from, how many of you are from the southeast United States? Let me see your hand. You're from the southeast United States. How many of you are from the west? Let me see your hand. You're from the west? Okay. How many of you from the north? Wow. Goodness gracious, the north. Hold those up again. Let me see that. Man. How many of you are from uh, Upper Eastern Seaboard? Upper Eastern Seaboard. Let me see your hand. How many of you are from outside the United States? Wow. Stand up. Stand up. All of those that's from outside the United States. Wow. Great. Just keep standing. Help us out right quick and tell us where you're from. Let me get out there just a little bit and find out where y'all, where you guys are from. Where are you from back there, ma'am? England. All right. Up here, where are you from? Germany. Bless you. All y'all from Germany? Okay, where are you from? Romania. Wow. Wonderful. All right, yes, sir. India, look at this, wow. What is your name? Ram. Ram, and uh, what part of India are you from? Central part of India, Hyderabad. How did you hear about the revival? <laughs> Through a friend in Monroe, Louisiana. In Monroe, Louisiana, how about that? Is this your first night, or was you here last night? This first night. God bless you. I pray the Lord just really blesses you, friend. God bless you. Hi. Where are you from? Germany. Germany? Yeah. <laughs> what part? Uh, in Bavaria. Bavaria. Okay. Wow, that's up in the Alps. Is that the Alps? No. Well, you're from Germany. Okay. <laughs> Good to have you folks with us. Are you... Are you um, what, what church do you go to there? It's an independent church, a Christian Santa Rima. Yeah. I could tell by watching your wife in the aisle here dancing a while ago, y'all were part of some, some kind of a Pentecostal worship group. <laughs> God bless you. Hi. Where are you, where are you from? Well, tell us your name and tell us where you're from. Tokyo. Tokyo. Wow, what's your name? Meg. Meg. 
and you're from Tokyo. Well, you look like you belong in Tokyo. <laughs> how, did, uh, how did you hear about the revival? Um, heard about this revival from my host mom, Teresa. Yeah. Well, I believe God's going to bless you, too. You know what? He's going to touch you and send you back. Are you going back to Tokyo? I'm going to Moody Bible Institute. Oh, you're going to Moody Bible Institute. Wonderful. Wow. Watch out, Moody. Watch out, Moody. Hi. What is your name and where are you from? My name is uh, Ed. Ed Colton and uh, my daughter. And uh, we are full-time with my wife and family, uh, missionaries to uh, mainland China. Well, <laughs> looks like you're already part of the revival, friend. Good. It's good. I need it. It's good. What's God doing in your life right now? Uh, there's uh, fire, and uh, I'm, I'm just numb all over. I'm numb. <laughs> Welcome to Revivaling. God bless you, friend. God bless you. Hi. What is your name? Wojciech Chaltowski. <laughs> yes, sir. Whatever you say. Hi. And what is your name? Yitka Gochaltowska. Where are you from? Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Oh. Thank you. Hi. Where are you from? Uh, we're uh, missionaries from Australia to Hong Kong and China. Uh, What's God doing in Hong Kong and China? Great things. Great things, yeah. But where, where, where we, uh, where we've been in uh, Hong Kong for 20 years now. Uh, I heard from uh, a friend of mine in New Zealand about what God is doing here. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, when, uh, when uh, he heard that we were coming to the States, uh, he, he wrote to me and said, hey, you've got to get to Brownsville there. Because even though God's doing good things, where we've, uh, we, we, we're still learning, we've still got a lot to learn, so that's why we're here. How long, how long can you stay? Uh, we've been here in the States for six weeks now, and uh, another two weeks to come, so we're scheduled to stay with you for a week. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. A week will just about do it, friend. God bless you. Just about do it. Hi. What is your name? Uh, Edward. Edward. And where are you from? Uh, the Philippines. The Philippines. Yes. God bless you. Good to have you with us. Hi, folks. Come on over. Where are you from? Well, tell us your name first. Ellen. And okay. Let me guess. You're from you're from Germany. Huh? You're from Sweden. Yes. Come on over. What is God doing in Sweden? Vad gör Gud i Sverige? Mycket, mycket. Very much, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how long are you going to be here? Whoa. <laughs> you know. I felt that. I felt that. Praise God. 
Isn't there wonderful? How, you know, you could just be standing there and the Lord just move in and invade your life. Isn't that wonderful? We, we see God do that in people's lives all the time. Just one minute you're standing there as normal. The next minute your whole life has changed. God just invades your life. Testimonies. Testimonies, come on up. Wow. Shoo. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hi, what's your testimony? Well, most of you know that I've been coming here um, to Revival since January. My husband was the pastor that was two hours away. And ever since, every month since then, uh, something has happened in our church. Our music ministers were married here on this stage, this platform, in March. And just my daughter, who was a cocaine addict, who is now in Teen Challenge in Columbus, Georgia, <laughs> came back to the Lord. And then my son, who was bribed to come here, uh, <laughs> with a car and he came back to the Lord and um, our church we, we pastor a real small church in a place called Grand Bay Alabama and um, we have now eight families in our church that's how small we are but most of the people left because of the revival so finances have not been real good but during the pastors conference past by the way, he is a pastor's pastor. I feel that he's my pastor, although my husband's a pastor, so don't, don't try to understand it. But, yeah. but anyway, um, during that conference, Pastor Kilpatrick had a word for people to give into good soil. And my husband had gotten a gift of $100 about a month before, and he keeps money in, a, in his wallet. And um, when he said that, I just turned and looked at him, and he said, you want my $100, don't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. And, and so we sowed that $100, and we prayed that the finances for this church and every church that was involved for this revival would be met. The day before yesterday, our church was paid off. Over $50,000. How much? $50,000. $50,000. So I know that we've been blessed, not 30, not 60, but 100 fold. And I'm going to make a plea to the pastors in this conference, I mean, in this meeting tonight. This is good soil. It is. Amen. Did your husband say any time you wanted another 100 well, we have made an agreement that we do so monthly into this ministry, and we're expecting even greater things. And we know that God is blessing because we've been involved now in another church. Um, there's more testimonies here, a Methodist church, and um, it's just been glorious there. And God is just moving all over Grand Bay. And we know that it's, it, it's just from this. It's from this. And this is... This is Chad Stahl. Her husband, Chad, come on up. Her uh, husband baptized me Sunday, as a matter of fact. And uh, you're a Methodist pastor? No, I'm a Methodist person, I guess you call it. <laughs> a Christian, that's what I am. I don't care what denomination it is. Um, I wanted to give my testimony. We were here last Thursday night, and um, Brother Hill had an altar call, and uh, I was dealing with some things. I just want to tell everybody how God works through this. I was given a videotape Monday at a Bible study before last Thursday of your sermon on a Sunday morning about where's the old man. And uh, we watched that at like midnight on Monday night after we'd been at Bible study for about four hours. And the sins that you announced, the things that you were convicting people of was exactly 
what I'd had in my life even as a Christian for years. And I knew God was just getting me ready for Thursday night because all week long I was dealing with the same stuff. It kept popping in my head. And uh, I would rationalize it by just saying, well, you've already prayed for it. God's forgiven you. Don't worry about it. You know, you're covered under grace. But it kept coming up. And Thursday night, we were in this, the cafeteria, and uh, Steve Hill had the altar call. And I was fighting it the whole way, and I was telling myself, you know, you're just going to go down there, and you're going to deal with God, then you're going to go back to the same sins. Just wait till you're serious and deal with them then. And that was my reason for not coming. And my prayer was, God, if you really want me to deal with it, make it real. Make it personal where I can't deny that it's you calling me. And after Steve counted from 60 to 1 and had the sermon, he stopped and he said he was going to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And he said, someone in the cafeteria has not dealt with God. And I looked at my wife. <laughs> I, uh, I looked at my wife and I said, we've got to go deal with this stuff. And uh, we did. And I asked God at the altar for a confirmation. And about that time, Steve Hill said, you've got to do two things. You've got to find a good Christian church that's growing, which I feel we're at. And the second thing, he says, if you were, you know, 12 years old when you are baptized and you've been living in a life of sin, you need to be baptized again, if, even if you're 27. And just lo and behold, I was baptized at 12 and was baptized at 27 on Sunday. So... <laughs> We use this pulpit in case the power of God falls. I, I've, got, I've got used to this, believe me, friends. Because a lot of times these people are giving their testimonies and the power of the Lord will hit them just like he did him just then. What's your name? Matt Reaver, sir. Oh, you uh, Dave's boy? I am. I am. Well, God bless you. This is Dave Reaver's son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your name is Matt? Yes, sir. What's going on with you? Oh, man, everything good right now. <laughs> Oh, the power's strong up here. It is. Yes, it is. Three weeks ago, I came here, and God totally miraculously touched my life like never before. Um, I was real critical about people being slain in the Spirit, and I didn't know what to think about that. <laughs> I mean, and the first night we came here, um, I was prayed for, and I said, God, touch me. Just hit me with a hammer if you got to. I'm 260 pounds, and I want, to get, I want something from you. And, uh, well, the first night, nothing happened. I got real disheartened. And uh, so I came up, and I was talking with Steve, and uh, he said he wanted to pray for me at the end. Well, I got up here, and he kept leading me around from place to place, and I was going, what are you doing, dude? Just pray for me. Let me get out of here. <laughs> and right over here... Uh, Steve stopped me, and I want to thank you for being obedient, Steve. And Steve stepped forward, and he said, in the name of Jesus, and that's all I heard. And he got about eight inches from my forehead, and my feet came up off the ground about this high. And, and when, when he said that, my, I was turned in midair and landed on my face. I was down 45 minutes down there just crying and weeping and, and thanking God for what he's done for me. And, and, and when I woke, I mean, I tried to get up, man. I mean, like, there ain't nobody in here can hold me down, but God just, like, put his foot on top of my head and said, dude, you're not getting up yet. And, uh, when I got up 45 minutes later, I was staggering. And my wife looked at me and goes, what's on your head, honey? And I had a brown mark for eight days. My pastor's here and my, part of my congregation is here. I had a mark on my forehead for eight days where the power of God had hit me so strong that it left a burn mark. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you this, guys. The power of God is so real. He can touch. He can heal. He can mend those broken hearted. He can heal those shoulders. Grandpa. <laughs> and he can save your soul. It, 
after that after those eight days was over it actually peeled away like a like a sticker and uh, I put it in a drawer <laughs> Wait a minute now. You put it in a drawer. So I just, every time I look at it, you know, I just go, man, I've been touched by God personally. Hi. What is your name? Valerie McKinley. And what has God done for you? Well, 11 years ago, I had a car accident, and 99.9% um, .9 of the cases don't make it. And God touched me in a very powerful way. But I still needed a recreative miracle of um, certain parts of my body, and one was the back and leg. And July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, we were here. And on the 1st, Brother Reuben um, asked me what I needed prayer for, and I told him. And he prayed. I got home that night and woke up the next morning. There was just no pain. And for 11 years every day, I had had severe pain, nothing the doctors could do. And praise God, today there's still no pain. Wow. Powerful. God bless you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Hi. What's your name? I'm Leslie Smith. Where are you from? Well, six weeks ago, I was from Montgomery, Alabama. Where are you from now? Pensacola, Florida. <laughs> What'd you do? Take up and move here? Yes. I'd like to tell everyone that there is no door shut so hard that our Lord cannot open it. And there is no mountain so high that he cannot level it. As a direct result of this revival, my home has been restored and my children have been saved. children will be baptized here tomorrow night and we're going to be in the new members class starting in August um, we had visited the revival a half a dozen times since last September and stayed in the home of Carl and Carolyn Shell we wanted to come and I kept asking the Lord please let us go sit at your feet and serve and on June the 14th I received a letter from my job transferring me to Bay Manette as a state employee of Alabama, effective July the 20th. And so my job transferred me here and my husband left to his employment. But on our first day here, he received a job. Before we ever arrived here, members of your church found us a home nicer than any home we've ever had. And we left our home there that we owned. And then he saved my children. And then the other night, my 12-year-old is a diabetic, and Sister Kilpatrick prayed for her as if she were her own daughter with such love and concern. And the Lord is going to heal her here. Yeah, yes. well, since you're going to be a member of my church, what's your name again? Leslie Smith. Welcome, Leslie. God bless you. <laughs> Hi. What's your name? I'm Daryl Yarbrough. Hey, Dale. Come on up here, man. Daryl, you're a pastor. Where do you pastor? I pastor in Monroe, Louisiana. What's going on? <laughs> I've never seen anything like this in all my life. I've been in Pentecost since I was in my mom's womb, if you want to say that. My mom and dad are pastoring in Lake Charles. I've been there, or they've been in the ministry almost 40 years. Me and my wife, we came here 12 weeks ago on a Friday and Saturday night, drove all night to get home and preach two services. Don't ever do that. But I did that. And, um, but it was very much worth it. We came here and we just sat and were just literally in awe. That night on Saturday night was the night that they didn't have the chairs out like they do now. And people just came almost an hour before service and began to praise God. And I cried out in my heart. 
We went to a church four years ago in Monroe that people gave up on. Nobody wanted to go there. In fact, a minister asked me, he said, why are you going there? There's no money there. We were traveling for three years before that. And we went to 23 people. We had a revival in the wrong way. It got down to about 13. <laughs> <laughs> You had a real move, didn't you? <laughs> this is real hard. We sold everything we had. My wife had to sleep on the floor. Didn't have any furniture. I vowed to God that I knew he called me. I knew he said to go there. So we made up our mind we we're going to stay. Four years later, 12 weeks ago, the Lord moved into our church. And we went from the anointing to the glory. Wow. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But there's people that are coming. Last Sunday, our church, in three sections, it seats 300. It was almost full. It looked great. I say that again? Your church, you went 23, you started with 23 and it went down to what? It went down to 13. Two years ago we were averaging maybe 50. And two years ago the Lord spoke to me in my office and I say that very carefully because I, I get real picky when people say the Lord said something and they're not changed or challenged. And the Lord spoke to me and he said your church will be built on the outcast, people that nobody else will want. Since that time, we've got murderers and drug addicts. We've got a guy that I want to tell you about. Since that time has come into our church, he's diagnosed with AIDS. He knows he's dying. He should have been dead three weeks ago on a Tuesday. But he came to our church 12 weeks ago. We got home and we prayed for this man. His name is Ken Wilson. He would have been here tonight, but he just could not get here. Ken was weighing 118 pounds. Nobody wanted him. We put our arms around him. He asked me, he says, do you mind if I come to your church? What an awesome statement. Do you mind? We said, I said, Ken, as long as I'm pastor here, you're welcome here. We put our arms around him and we prayed a simple prayer. Today, Ken weighs 152 pounds. Ken has a degenerative brain disorder that's eating away his brain cells. They said he would just live to be a vegetable and then die with AIDS. We said, no way. We began to pray for him, and the Lord touched him, and the doctor gave him a report yesterday, or not, about a week ago, and said, Ken, I don't understand this. Your brain has not deteriorated any since we've met last, and you're starting to look better, I believe. I believe for too long that we're going to be able to say Ken Wilson's healed of AIDS with doctor reports. And it's a direct result because I didn't understand everything. I've been a Pentecost. I'm a third generation preacher. I'm fifth generation to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I still don't understand everything. I know that for a long time I cried out to God for a move of His Spirit. And I was willing to do whatever it took. And I came here 12 weeks ago. And I said, God, if you're going to do it, please do it now. And he did. And on the way home, even, me and my wife, we work together. She's here tonight, and 20 other of my people are here tonight. Help them stand up. Praise God. God's been answering a lot of prayers, but the other night... I was driving home and God gave me a song and I'm not even a songwriter I sing but I'm not a songwriter and it was so wonderful and it's just simply the Lord has been so good to me sing it for us can my wife come in yeah come here and sing it come here girl move fast
Y'all gonna sing? I want her to play. You wanna play? Come on. She's fine. Play. She plays. You gonna sing? This is my testimony. It's very simple. Just listen. It goes, the Lord has been so good to me. The Lord has been so good to me. When I call, he'll be there. He will answer my the Lord has been so good to me. He's going to be better to you, too. I don't see how he could. <laughs> Revival's meant to me. It's been something that I've always desired, and I was willing to do anything that it took. I'll sell everything I have again if I have to. God recently gave me a brand new home, house full of furniture. He's blessed us. We have so many visions and dreams, and I know in God's timing it'll all happen but revival means so much more to me now. When you see a life come into your church, a former homosexual that was living on the streets of Los Angeles, had over 300 encounters as a prostitute, come into your church hurting and discouraged and nowhere else to go, and looks you in the eye and says, can I come here? And then you see God touch him and change him. And now he's going around praying for people. He went with me to a meeting last week and gave a testimony and it's just incredible to see what God has done in just a short amount of time. Revival is all that I want. That's why we came five and a half, six hours here tonight. Friend, I want to tell you, if you're here tonight and you're wondering if it's real, take it from a guy who had gotten hard and thought he'd seen and done it all and heard it all as a, coming up as a preacher's kid. You haven't, you don't even, you haven't even scratched God's, even his littlest what he could do. It's here tonight, and I just encourage you, don't let anybody ever despise you or put you down. God loves you for who you are, and he'll take you right there, and he will be so good to you. Hi. Hey. Well, you, uh, you finally got a bed to sleep on, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what's God done in your life in this move? Whew. Uh, well, let's see how long do we have. Um, I don't know if I can explain it. It's so hard to explain. You just have to be here and you have to feel it. But he's done a work in my life. Um, I don't know, just a renewing. Sometimes we get so tired as pastors and doing the work of the ministry. And I've always had a desire in my heart to write. And, and I... And I, I almost don't want to say this because I don't want anybody to think anything wrong by what I'm saying, by bragging or anything. But years ago when I was in Bible college, I wrote and arranged some music. And it had been years since I had done that. And ever since I had gotten back from the revival, God in the middle of the night would, would just give me choruses and just write out a scripture. I mean, just songs. And it's been flowing uh, every week since then. And he's just done such a work in my life and trying to lead me and, and showing me my giftings and my ministry. I feel like if you and your husband will keep the spirit you've got and the humble spirit and humble attitude, I feel like God's going to really use you. And there's more. He's got more for you. You may think this is great. It's only the beginning. God bless you, folks.
is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news the spirit of the sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news Send you to the poor. To bind up the broken hearted. To bring freedom to the captive. Release the ones in dark.
I believe everyone is here under divine appointment. God's brought you here. And you know, the Lord, He sets up these testimonies. And even, uh, Matt, where are you at, Matt Reaver? Where are you at? Up in the balcony, God bless you, brother. You know, when you said that there was a spot on your forehead, you know, you needed to say that because there's some folks here that just can't handle strange things. <laughs> but you know, you know what I thought of? As soon as you said that, I thought, I wonder if, if Paul put them scales in his pocket. <laughs> you remember? For those of you that don't know the story, Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus to do more damage to the Christians, and he was hit. He was what you would call slain. <laughs> he was not resting in the Lord, friend. He was slain. He went down and scales formed over his eyes and about three days later they fell off. You not wonder what he did with them. Probably put them in his pocket. You know, so if he had had a drawer, he probably put them in his drawer. So... Hallelujah. But that was for somebody here that's going, you know, I just can't handle that kind of stuff. Friend, if you'd read this book, just, if you'd read it just one time through, I don't know what's in your Bible, but I got all sorts of additions to this thing. There's one part in here that talks about the strange oddities in the Bible. Yep. Friend, there's so much stuff in here. You think that's strange? Not at all. He can do anything he wants. And so I'm, I'm expecting, I would, in this revival, we're believing God, and, and I, I marvel, I was talking with a pastor tonight, we marvel at what's happening, we're humbled by it, but also we know that God could do something like this. We could be here in a service one night, and the Lord, under His, in His divine time, could hit the entire city all at once. He could just descend, the Lord could descend at University Mall. He could descend in the movie theaters. He could descend all over this city, all at once, just come down. And in all the houses around here, people, if you don't believe this can happen, you're God's small, friend. This happened in Wales, in the Wales Revival. God moved, swept. You, they, matter of fact, they had maps. They had maps that they would darken in the maps where the revival moved day by day. They could, you could see on the map where it swept through villages and towns. And people were moaning and groaning in the spirit, in their little, in their little, uh, their little shacks, and in their little apartment buildings, they were they were, they were being hit by the power of God, and hadn't even been to a meeting. And so we're believing God for one day, just sort of coming down. And and I know we we got those of you that have tried to call this church. This church has got eight phone lines. They receive about 20 calls a minute, and uh, we called today several times, and they were busy, which means. More than eight calls were coming in at that one particular second that we were calling. And I can't imagine what would happen if the power of God just came down in this city. Because see, people would immediately start, they would call here. Because they had no know this, this is a place that kind of stuff happens. And so, we're believing, I said that to say this, believe if God be your partner, make your plans large. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'd like for everyone, Charity, I want you to come ahead and come on up. Sis, you're going to sing Run to the Mercy Seat in just a minute. I'd like for everyone to pray this prayer. If you're in the chapel, if you're in the choir room, the cafeteria, in any overflow room, if you're watching from home, I want you to pray this prayer with us tonight. Everyone pray this prayer out loud. If you're in the hallway and you can hear me, I want you to pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, Speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Last night I preached on how to receive, or how to get the Lord's attention. And uh, it, was, it was a message that... Uh, 
was easy to understand and it was more of a, I would call it a, it, it would lean more towards a little Debbie snack and cake message rather than Brussels sprouts. And um, a lot of folks responded, hundreds and hundreds of people responded. Matter of fact, I went to a dry cleaner today to have uh, some clothes done and as I walked in, uh, the lady looked at me, she goes, Bill! I went, Hill? She goes, yeah, Hill! She goes, last night, I was there for the first time. I got saved, my husband got saved, our whole lives have been changed. And so, people, people respond, they respond to the messages. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord, I want you in just a few minutes to respond to Jesus, okay? That means do something about your relationship with God. 35,000 people, it's way over that, have come to these altars, but we keep the number low. 35,000 people have come, and last night I was looking through these cards, and the night before last, I was looking, well, when was it? Yeah, Wednesday? Today's Thursday. Last night I was looking through these cards, and I was noticing people, businessmen, that were getting saved for the first time. I was watching these you, folks from all over the southeast and folks from up north, out west, getting saved. And what they're doing, friend, is people are responding. Okay? So when you're in, in your seat tonight and the word of the Lord touches you, tonight's message is going to be difficult for some of you. It's going to be very hard. I'm speaking on the rebel's reward. It's what you, you get what you deserve, okay? The rebel's reward. It's going to be a very hard message. For some of you, it's going to be hard to swallow. You might gag on it. But I want to tell you, God is trying to speak to your heart. You need to do something about it when he speaks to you. Are you listening? It doesn't matter what building you're in tonight, you can't get away from the Holy Ghost. You say, well, I'm tucked away safe in the choir room. No, you're not, friend. There's always three hanging out, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I was going to read the entire chapter, but I'm not going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is a story about disobedience. I know many pastors that are here tonight have preached on this story of Saul's disobedience. He was ordered of the Lord to destroy the Amalekites and everything that belonged to them and he disobeyed God and this is a confrontation between Saul and Samuel if you'll learn to look at 1st Samuel chapter 15 verse 20 I was gonna read the whole chapter but I'm not going to right now I really feel that this is what the Lord would have me to do verse 20 and, the, and Saul said unto Samuel yea I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites and but the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal and Samuel said hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams verse 23 for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry now friend look at me before we go any further if I preached on this the way I'm gonna preach one night on that one scripture some of you would be shocked at your rebellion what the Lord likens your rebellion to I want you you know what this means right here you know what this scripture means look at it again for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You want to know what that means? That means rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. That's what it means. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Now we're going to ask the Lord. Have we already prayed? Have we? We've asked the Lord to speak to our hearts. How many men it? Then we're not going to pray again. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was up early this morning 
to hear from the Lord. He took me to this portion of Scripture. This is one that I have never preached on as an evangelist, although I have referred to it on many occasions. As I began to study Saul's rebellion, I felt the heat of the devil's breath. Listen to me. You listen to me, friend. As I began to study Saul's rebellion, it was 6.30 this morning. I got in at 2.30. At 6.30, I was preparing this message, and I felt the heat of the devil's breath on my back. It was as if Lucifer himself was breathing down my neck. He was peering over my shoulder saying, don't you dare talk on that subject. I'll come against you like never before. I'll take away your train of thought. I'll bring a spirit of despondency on the congregation. I'll cause confusion. You preach on that subject and you're up to your neck in enemy warfare. Besides that, Steve, you're tired. Just relax this evening. Calm down. There's no urgency. Some other time you can share on this subject, but not tonight. Friend, I appreciated so much Lucifer's encouraging words. I want to tell you, When he takes the time to discourage me or send his little imps to try to whitewash a God-sent, God-inspired, Holy Ghost-convicting message, if he's going to go through all the trouble to try to calm me down, then I know I'm supposed to preach it. So I just want to say... I just want to say, devil, thank you for your attention this morning. Your words were just the boost I needed to go forward with this message. And I'd like to also take this time to proclaim that you're a liar. You are the father of all lies. The word says there is no truth in you. Pastors, if the word comes to you from somewhere that there will be no revival in your church, write it down and underline it. Revival's on its way, friend. By the way, that was a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Therefore, devil, your negative comments this morning were all lies. You discourage because you know that God encourages. You say no one will respond because you know this is exactly what needs to be preached, and they will respond. So here we go. I want everyone, I'm not going to preach long on this, so you pay attention. In just a few minutes, I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond. This is going to hit hundreds of you in this auditorium, hundreds that are in the overflow rooms, and those of you at home. But I want to tell you, if you do not respond, to the arrows of the Lord. Now, the Lord has arrows. They're sharp. They strike like lightning, and they stick fast. His arrows, he is a master marksman. He knows you. He will hit the bullseye every single time, friend. And when he hits your heart tonight, there is absolutely nothing you're going to be able to do with that conviction. You can go outside these doors and drink a case of beer. You'll wake up on Friday morning 
with an arrow sticking out of your heart. You can try to go to sleep tonight. Try to brush off this message. Just brush it off. That wasn't for me. That wasn't for me. That wasn't for me. And you're not going to be able to sleep. Why? Because you can't sleep with an arrow sticking out of your heart. You turn, it hurts everywhere you go. You're not going to sleep tonight, friend. The best thing you can do is come down and let the Holy Ghost surgeon remove that arrow at these altars. It's the conviction of the Holy Ghost. You obey God. Rebellion is an open and avowed renunciation, renouncing of the authority of the government to which one owes allegiance. Don't let me lose you on this. In simple terms, rebellion is resisting the authority over you. When a parent comes to me and says, I have a rebellious son, they are saying, my son does not obey. He is obstinate. To rebel is to buck up against. It is to defy. It is to be disobedient, insubordination. It is to revolt, uprisings, to be disloyal, to be mutinous, to be resistant, to be seditious, to be treasonable, to be ungovernable, to be unruly. That is what rebellion means. How many have been rebellious at one time in your life? Rebellion. This is what this scripture is dealing with, friend. We're going to touch it for a few minutes tonight. Some of you, listen to me closely. God has done everything he could for you. You keep bucking up against him. I'm speaking not just to lady. I'm speaking to some pastors. I want to tell you, pastors, he will pass you by. He will pass you by. You are not God's plan for this planet. He might just use the Episcopalian down the road. He might just pour out his Holy Ghost on a bunch of people that don't even have a church yet. But there is a rebellious spirit, friend, that has, it has weaved itself into the fabric of this nation. And it's weaved itself into the church. Some of you are backslidden tonight. God has been trying to get a hold of you. He's been speaking to you. He's been ministering to you. He's been whispering to you in the night hours. God has been trying to get a hold of you, but you're rebellious, friend. Stay with me. Don't get upset at me. I'm God sent. A rebel is different from an all-out enemy. I discovered, never even thought about this this morning. An enemy does not owe allegiance to the government which he attacks. He's an enemy. He's not a rebel. He's an enemy. Rebellion is disobeying God's will. Nothing is so provoking to God as disobedience, setting up our wills in competition with his. I'm going to do it my way. Young people, you listen to me. I know there's about a 1,000 across the street, but there's a lot of young people in this room tonight and listening in the overflow rooms. Let me tell you something. The moment you bow your knee to Jesus Christ, he becomes Lord. The greatest thing that ever happened to me since my salvation is realizing that I'm not in charge anymore. When you realize that, that he is Lord, he's got it all mapped out, he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He's in charge, Matt Reaver. He knows what's going to happen in your life. You have made him Lord of your life. That way, since he is Lord of your life, he can put a button on your forehead. He can do anything he wants because he's Lord. He is Lord. Stubbornness has to do with a fixedness. Stay with me, friends. I know this is hurting already. Some of you, you know what you do? You sit there and you start fidgeting. I can see you fidget from here, man. You start fidgeting. You turn to your wife. You go, I've got to go to the bathroom. You don't have to go to the bathroom. Matter of fact, we'll put ushers at the bathroom. They're going to stand there and go, don't you lie. Do you really have to go to the bathroom? But some of you are already moving around like this because you know 
God's brought you here and you know you're nailed. He's got a plan, friend. Stubbornness has to do with a fixedness, a stiffness, an inflexibility, a fixed opinion, not to be moved or persuaded by reason. Obstinate. The philosopher Locke, he said years ago, stubbornness and obstinance and obstinate disobedience must be mastered with blows. This was said 200 years ago. Stubbornness and obstinate disobedience must be mastered with blows. And I want to tell you, he wasn't just talking about a child. You know, men, men of God in this room, you know, sometimes it's a two by four, isn't it? That's what God's had. He's, he's used that on some of us. He said, I'm going to get your attention, son. He did the Saul of Tarsus. He got his attention in a heartbeat. He got a, he got a hold of Charles Finney. Charles Finney was just cruising along. He's he at home having some devotions, and suddenly lightning hit him and just swept through his body. Shoo, shoo. He said it was electricity shooting through him. I got a feeling the Lord is just getting his attention because he was about to shake America. Maybe Charles Finney had a little stubbornness in him. I don't know. Maybe he had a little bit of his own will type of thing going on. And then God just said, no, we're going to rid you of that right now. Lightning from heaven will do this. Stubbornness. I preached just the other night on stubborn as a mule. I doubt if you were here. Most of you, how many were here for that message? A handful of you? Well, I tell you, it's a new crowd every night. I could preach tonight, stubborn as a mule. <laughs> Go ahead. I preached on stubborn as a mule. The Bible says, do not be as a horse or as a mule which have no understanding, where, whose, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Stubbornness, unyielding, bullheaded, cantankerous. Any, know anybody like that? Pigheaded, hardheaded, headstrong, inflexible, self-willed, set in one's own ways, stiff-necked, unbending, unmanageable, unreasonable. I preached on the fact that was a couple weeks ago that God has been trying to get a hold of many of us, and I brought out a couple different bits in this place. One was called the Lynn McKenzie Gag and Hack Bit. With it, she's, Lynn McKenzie is a, is a world-renowned barrel racer, and it's the most severe bit that I know of on the market. And it's a bit that will break the horse's uh, nose cartilage. It'll knock off its blood supply and cut its mouth if it doesn't stop. It's a serious bit. It's called the Lynn McKenzie Gag and Hack bit. And then I brought an altar up here, a halter, just a little cloth halter, little green halter made of cotton that you just slip over the horse's head and you neck rein him. Those of you that ride, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you don't even have to do that. Just lay the thing down and the horse is just going to go. You can just sort of wiggle his ear and he'll go anywhere you want him to go. Some of us are so stubborn, the Lord's got to put a gag and hack bit on us to make us do anything but I want to tell you, he's tired of that. He's tired of that. Anytime he wants you to move to the left or to the right, it takes an act of God to get you to move. He's, heaven's got to stop to get you to make a move. But I'm going to tell you, friend, one day he'll put you out to pasture. He'll say, I'm tired of it. I'm going to put another man in there. I'm tired of that. I'm going to put another woman in there. I'm tired of that. Cut him down. Be like the one, friend. I want to be one of those people that the Lord just slips a halter over. You know? Better yet, I want to be like Roy Rogers' trigger. You know? Just whistles and I come. Forget the halter. I'm just here. For the next few moments, let's take a quick look at the life of Saul at his act of disobedience and the results. And we're going to move quickly through this, friend. We can hardly read the history of Saul without some feeling of pity. He was not a tyrant who made himself king and ruled the people against their will. He is introduced to us in the Word of God as a choice young man, possessed with a striking personal presence and as a member of a wealthy and powerful family. He was chosen by God himself, was anointed by God's prophet, and became king at the express desire of the people. He was a brave and noble man. 
He led the Israelites against their enemies and by God's help was victorious over them. But there were also some terrible blots in his character. His persecution of David for, more, for mere jealousy was nothing more than wicked cruelty. You know how he tried to kill David. Nevertheless, when we read this portion of Scripture and digest his sad history, we cannot fail to be moved with pity for one who was so great yet so unhappy. He reminds me of many people in this room. Such great potential, but so unhappy. You want to know why? Rebellion. Rebellion. That's all it is, friend. The words I just read to you from Scripture contain a lesson which Saul had never learned. Listen carefully because there are hardened, there are hundreds here tonight that need to learn from Saul and let his mistakes, listen, friend, let Saul's mistakes be a springboard for your advancement in the kingdom of God. Saul served God and appeared zealous in God's cause so far as the way of doing this suited his own pleasure and purposes. He served God as long as things were working out well for him. Whenever self had to be denied and God's will be made the rule of action instead of his own, then he rebelled. I'm speaking to some backsliders in this room. Things are going well as long as things go your way. Some of you backslid because you lost the feeling. I pray the feeling off of you. I pray the feeling off you. Want to know why? Because I'm asking God for soldiers. I'm asking God for warriors. I'm asking God to raise up just a few green berets that don't care whether they feel like going to war or not. They're committed men and women of God. But what did you do? Things didn't work out the way you want, you'd want them to. He didn't answer your prayers as quick as you wanted them answered. Everybody didn't come to Jesus overnight like you wanted them to. And you didn't feel the same thing you felt at the first time you got saved. So you backslid. You're a wimp, friend. I want to tell you something. You're not worth a nickel. You're pitiful. And don't tell people you're a Christian. Tell them you're a heathen. Tell them you're a heathen. Don't walk around saying, I'm a Christian. I'm just not right with God right now. Tell them, I'm a heathen. You confuse everybody, friend. Tell them I'm a heathen. I'm as bad as a street junkie. I don't know God. I'm away from God. I want to tell you, you're a rebellion, friend. You listen to this message tonight, God's going to speak to you. I'm telling you, listen. Whenever self, speaking of Saul, had to be denied and God's will made the rule, he rebelled. In fact, Saul never really worshipped God at all. He worshipped self. And he never learned this great truth that obedience, listen friends, obedience to God is the only thing pleasing in his eyes. Leonard Ravenhill, who I, I spent several years with before he died, and I love that dear man. That was his favorite word, obedience. He would say, pour it all in a funnel. Everything that's going on all over the world, pour it all in the funnel. The only thing that needs to come out the bottom of that spout is obedience. Obey God. Do what he tells you to do. Before sharing a few rele relevant points to this portion of Scripture, let me strike one more parallel. Saul stands to us as a type of those who profess to be Christians and act in a, me in a, in a measure as Christians. Nevertheless, they follow their own ways just if they were under no Christian vows at all. I hope you heard that. They have never learned the great gospel lesson of obedience. They've never learned how to obey, nor seen that obedience to God requires self-denial and discipline of ourselves. Now, here's just a few points, and we're going to pray for you tonight. Number one is this that I find from this story. God told Saul what to do. God told Saul what to do. He said this. He said, now go. This is verse 3 of that chapter. Read it later or read it now, whatever you want to do. I don't care. He said, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all. You know what that meant? It meant go 
and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all. Some of us are so dense in this room. I spoke last Saturday night on the devil's dunce. Remember that? No, I wasn't here. But I brought in a dunce cap. And some of us are the devil's jester. We do everything the devil wants us to do. We're a little plaything of the devil. We are a dunce. We're, we're stupid. This is so clear, man. And the Lord has come up to you and he said, you know, the Bible is so clear. He says, oh, he says, honor me, I'll honor you, the Bible says. Draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. Resist the devil, he will flee. It's all one plus one is two, friend. The word of God is, the simplicity of it scares me. This simplicity of this Saul, go, smite, destroy all. His orders were crystal clear. Amalek, like Jericho, was to be entirely devoted to destruction. Saul's personal feelings or his reasonings are beside the point. God said, go and destroy, and that meant? And destroy. Let me make this more personal. God has told many of you exactly what to do. I can't make it any clearer than this, friend. Concerning Jesus, this is what the Lord has told you to do. He said this, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. The scripture, friend, is flooded with simplistic commands. Do this and I will bless you. You don't have to go, God, I don't understand that. Mark Twain said, it's not the scriptures I don't understand that bother me. It's the scriptures I do understand that bother me. And those are scriptures you do understand. Concerning sin, the Bible says through Genesis to Revelation, repent. What do you want me to do with my pornographic problem, God? Repent. What do you want me to do with my adulterous lifestyle? Repent. My mouth is so vile. It's so vulgar. What do you want me to do, God? Repent. It's so clear. Turn, the Bible says, from your wicked ways. Concerning sin, once again, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, don't flip there, friend, just listen. Abstain from all appearance of evil. What do you mean, God? I mean abstain from all appearance of evil. Is anybody listening, friend? God told Saul what to do. He told him what to do. It was so clear. There wasn't any shadow there, friend. There wasn't any hazy message. There wasn't any interpreter needed. It was clear. Jesus says, be ye holy. The Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy. The Bible says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Friend, how much clearer do you want it? God has told you what to do. Those of you that are heavy into some vice, I love the testimonies. Last night we had a couple folks come up that had been delivered from drugs. And they came up and both of them were heavy pot addicts. And I mean, marijuana, friend, will suck you into a cesspool, man. You, it's so hard to get free from that because it's, a, it's, 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 it's affordable. It's affordable. And you, before you know it, you're smoking 20, 30 joints a day, and you can't live without being high. And both these, this young man and this young woman stood up here, and they testified. They got saved in this revival, went home, flushed the marijuana down the toilet. They flushed it down the toilet. It was so clear, friend. God, what do you want me to do with this pot? You know? Well, Teresa, you've just come to me. You're a new creature in Christ. Roll a joint. Smoke it. Party hardy, Teresa. It's a new day. Get real, friend. God speaks. It is so clear. Another young lady came here with a bag of CDs. Okay? A bag of CDs. She went home after the revival, and guess what she saw on her walls? Junk. Demonic garbage in four-color, uh, slick, 
commercial posters, you know, just to reach out and, and suck the heart of our youth in. And, and she looked around her room and, and she went to her, her CD cabinet. She opened it up and it was all filth. So she took it out. She took the things and she started beating them to death with a hatchet. That is what I call abstaining from all appearance of evil. You know, get away from it. I could stay on that all night, but I'm not. Concerning the devil, what does the Lord say? He says it's simple. Resist the devil and he will flee. No, but some of you can't do that. No, I'm telling God told you what to do. God told Saul what to do. I'm talking about the, de the rebel's reward. You're going to get what you deserve. You're going to get what you deserve. God tells you what to do about the devil. Resist Satan. I mean, turn from him. Get away from him. No, some of y'all have to date him. Okay? You're not going to go steady no more, but you're going to be friends. You want just enough of his life. You know, you gave back his varsity jacket. You gave back some of his paraphernalia, but you're keeping his ring. You're keeping a few little doodads around. The Bible says resist him. Those of you, and I, God just spoke to somebody. Some of you are trying to break up with somebody. Can I tell you how to break up with them? Break up with them. <laughs> That's how you do it. You say things like this. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Did you hear that? Here are all the things you gave me. Take them all back. If he gave you a car, sis, and it's not the man for you, give the keys, the car, everything back to him. Break up. Give no place to the devil, Ephesians says. Concerning your heart, I'm talking about God told Saul what to do. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Friend, the Lord has told you what to do, but many of you are so, so stubborn and so rebellious. Well, the second thing tonight is Saul disobeyed the clear command of the Lord. He rebelled. He became a rebel. You heard what happened. He destroyed all the worthless items, but he kept the good ones. He kept what he wanted, friend. Some of you are just like that. The Lord saved your soul, backslider, years ago. But you could not break away from some of those nice little items that were still out there. The Lord said, get rid of it all. Destroy it all. It's history. That is Egypt. You have crossed over. It is over. Don't ever go back. No, 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 no. You got yourself a little canoe, man. You're back over the Red Sea. Back to Egypt. Saul disobeyed the clear command of the Lord. Many of you, God has told you what to do, but you're living in direct disobedience. The word says, but Saul spared Agog and the best of the sheep. Is that how you pronounce his name? Agog. 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 Paul spared Agog and the best of the sheep and of all that was good. The command was spare not, but he spared. His natural instinct, friend, and this is, where, this is why the Lord says lean not to your own understanding. His natural instinct as a judge and as a knowledgeable man is to spare the best. This is ridiculous. I mean, that is a good cow. <laughs> and utterly destroy the rest. His own interests overruled the direct word of God. I've shared with you a story in this revival which I can tell tonight, hardly anybody's heard it, so I'm going to share it. But I had a man come to our meeting one time that would have, he was having trouble with his marriage. And I saw him drive up. He got saved a couple days earlier in the revival. He got rededicated or he was backslid, came back to God, whatever you want to call it. We call it backsliding. And he came, he came forward in the revival. 
But I had watched him earlier pull up in the parking lot of the church. And he pulled up in a beautiful, beautiful Corvette convertible. Married man with a child. He pulled up and he came up to the altar. And he wanted a prayer that night. I didn't know what he was struggling about. And the Lord spoke to me something very, very spiritual. He said these words. He said, say these words, three words to him. Sell the vet. <laughs> Sell the vet. And I go, I've, I've learned to live in obedience, friends. So I looked at the guy, and he was ready for me to say, Yea, I say unto you, thou art a prophet sent from God. You will be sent out in the multitudes, will bow to you. He, that's what he was waiting on. But no, I looked at him. I said, brother, before we pray, i got one thing to say to you. Sell the vet. His eyes <laughs> listen, burst in tears. He fell on his face, wept. You want to know why, friend? The vet, the Corvette, that vet was his last toy. That was his toy. I told him, like we got down on our knees, and I told him, I said, when you're out in that car and your wife's not with you and you pull up at a red light, and another car pulls up with you, maybe a young blonde-haired gal, you know, some, maybe some girl half your age. You pull up next to her and she sees you in that shiny red convertible. You look over here, suddenly you're not married anymore. You're free as a bird. She sees you. You've even at times hidden your wedding ring. And you just grab that wheel. You rev the engine. Friend, I want to tell you, sell the vet. Sell the vet. He said, he said, God has been dealing with me about that car. He said, because when I'm in that car, I'm a different person. I'm talking about, friend, Saul disobeyed the clear command of the Lord. If God's dealing with you tonight, Brandon, I'm not against Corvettes. Do not misquote me. If you do misquote me, anyone can get the tape and you will look stupid. Whenever self-interest is allowed a place in our service for the Lord, is, it will surely cost us a price that we cannot afford. So friend, Saul disobeyed God. And we're going to close in just a minute, but I want to, this is going to get a little hairy, then we're going to close. Saul's sin found him out. That's the third point. Saul's sin found him out. This is elementary, my dear Watson. The Lord spoke to Samuel and said, Saul has not performed my commandments. God's always talking to somebody, friend. I remember a young lady that came forward in a meeting. She was a, she is as wicked as they come. She was a snot, okay? She came forward right over here in a meeting, and uh, she was just standing there, staring at me. And uh, we'd had about three or 400 people saved in that revival, and God was really moving, and she just came because somebody made her come type of thing, and she was there. She was set, somebody, as a matter of fact, somebody pushed her forward. And so she was standing there, and I, and I said, uh, what's your name? She goes, you're a man of God. Tell me. I looked at her, and I said, sis, let me tell you something. My name's Steve. What's your name? And I said, I don't know your name. She said, she said, Judy. I said, yeah, I say unto you. The Lord saw you as a child when your father committed incest with you. He has seen the pain over the years that you've harbored. It says a cancer growing inside of you. It is a bitterness and a hatred that you have towards all men. She burst into tears fell to the ground, began moaning and groaning, came up to me about an hour later. She said, how did you know? I'm telling you, friend, God speaks to people. God spoke. God spoke to Samuel. He spoke to Samuel. There was a night in this revival. I was preaching along. I was right where you're sitting right there, Pastor. I was preaching and stopped right in the middle of the message, in midstream, right in the middle of a thought. I stopped. The Lord stopped me in the middle of the message. And I don't do that. Just stop. And I turned and I said, there's someone here. If you don't get saved right now, it's going to be over. You've got to get saved right now. And a man jumped up from this area over here. Some of y'all remember it. 
He jumped up and ran to the altar. And this is what was going on. He came up to me afterwards. He said, this is what I did, Steve. He said, this is my first night in the revival. I did not know God. I didn't know anything about what was going on here. But, but I was so lost. I said, God, if you are out there and you love me and you care for me, then stop that preacher in the middle of his message and have him call me out. But Saul said to Samuel, I have performed the commandment of the Lord, Samuel. But listen, friend, at the same time, now stay with me just for a minute, friend. At the same time as he was saying this, Samuel was listening to something different. He was listening to the bleeding of the sheep. He was listening to the cattle. This is what Samuel was hearing. Listen. And Saul was saying, I have done what you told me. I have done what you told me. And Samuel was saying, No, I hear something different, Saul. Is anyone listening tonight, friend? I want you to hear that again because this is going to tell on you. It will tell on you. Your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. What's that I hear, Saul? I thought you destroyed all the Amalekites. I thought you destroyed all the cattle. I thought you destroyed all the sheep. Wait a minute, Saul. What's that going to heaven? Is that the sound of disobedience? What is that, Saul? What is that, Saul? Friend, listen to me. Turn it off. Listen, friend. That right there is the same. If you're a thief in this room, the Lord hears the rattling of that silver. If you're a pornographer in this room, and matter of fact, turn it on again, Doug. If you're a pornographer in this room, the Lord hears the turning of the pages. He hears it, friend. He sees it. Don't you understand? God sees everything. And he will tell the prophet. He will tell the preacher. He will tell us what's going on in your life. Don't you tell me tonight that God's not watching. He sees everything. He hears everything. Saul, you have been found out. Abel's blood will cry to me from the ground. Some of you, I want to tell you what this was to Saul that scared him half to death. Look at me, friend. Some of you got it. That brought a chuckle at first, but I want to tell you what it does. It'll sink in in a minute. It'll sink in in a minute. That's what the Lord heard. He heard those cattle and heard those sheep. He was supposed to hear silence. And he looked over at Saul and he said, you rebellious, obstinate, wicked man. All I wanted you to do was kill him. All I wanted you to do was to obey me. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I don't want those cattle. I don't want those sheep. I don't want all that junk. I want you, Saul. You traded your soul for a few head of cattle and a few bleeding sheep. Some of you are exactly there right now tonight. That's what you've done. And I want to tell you, it's a cry in the, eye, in the ears of God. Some of you are saying, I'm living for God. I'm not that bad. But your sin is echoing through the corridors of time. Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their land. They presented a portion of the proceeds to God. But their guilty heart was sounding in the heavens, friend. That's what the Lord heard. Ananias and Sapphira stood before Peter. Yes, Peter. That was the price. Whew. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I don't want your money. I want your life. 
Saul, I don't want all that stuff. I own the cattle of a thousand hills. I own it all. I want you. The eyes and the ears of the Lord are upon us tonight as they were on Saul. They're watching. He's looking to see whether we're going to be faithful to him and his word. Every act of disobedience is an act of disobedience against God. Don't you ever forget that. Your rebellion, your sin will always find you out. Sin is a tattletale. Sin is a tattletale. You don't know how many 15, 14, 13, 12-year-old girls I've prayed for right in here. Pregnant. Pregnant. Want to know why? Sin's a tattletale. Sin's a tattletale. It'll tell on you, man. The last point tonight, and Charity's going to come to sing in just a second. The result of your sin, friend, the result of your rebellion is rejection of God. It's the rejection of God. That's hell on earth. Is anybody listening? The Bible says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. That means occultism. That means sorcery, wizardry, conjuring up evil spirits. Your rebellion tonight, if you don't obey God and come forward to this altar and get right with the Lord, get your wicked heart cleansed, you are the same as a black witch. You're the same, friend, as a warlock. You're the same as a sorcerer. You might as well be on the psychic channel. God sees you like that, friend. It's idolatry. Anything that sets itself up in place of God is an idol is an idol. If there's anything between you and God, friend, it is an idol and you need to get your heart right tonight. Pay attention to what the preacher's saying, not what's going on around. Because thou has rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you from being king. There's so many scriptures, friends, that we could share, but we're going to close. I want to tell you, friend, some of you think, well, you know, disobedience, you know, being rebellion, there's nothing, being in rebellion, there's nothing wrong with that. God's been trying to deal with so many of you in this room. He's told you what to do. He's told you what to do. You know what's right. And him not, to, to those who do not do it, once they know it is sin, he has told you what to do. I'm not dealing with a bunch of heathen in the jungles of Africa that have never heard the gospel. I'm dealing with people tonight that most of us have heard the gospel. Brother, just get on your knees right here. God's going to deal with you, okay? Right here. Stay right here, okay? Right here. God's touching your life. Whew. Satan, you're losing tonight, I'm telling you. And I'm closing with this, friend. Some of you, you say, well, you know, rebellion, that's no big thing. At least I'm not as bad as she is or as he is. I'm not a narcotics addict or I'm not this or I'm not that. Friend, the Bible says, if you read the book of Revelation 21.8, it's spooky. It says, for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters, which all and all liars will find their part in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Idolaters. If you have set anything up between you and God, a relationship, money, a career, and you're going after that more than you're going after God, you are an idolater, friend. I hate to say it so clear, but I've got to because one day we will stand before the Lord. You and I will stand before God, and God's going to hold me accountable for the first message I preached in August of 1996, and I will be obedient. By the way, it's August. My, my. Blink your eyes, it'll be Thanksgiving. Blink them again, it'll be Christmas. And some of you have blown the whole year. And just eight months ago, you were on your knees saying, this year I'm going to get right with God. And here we are, almost at the end of summer, and you're still not right with God. You're rebellious and stubborn, friend. Tonight is the night for you to give your heart to Jesus. I want everyone to stand. 
In the overflow rooms, I want you to stand. Everyone in the front with chairs, I want you to move them up to the right, to the left. Charity, come on up. God bless you, son. Just stay right there. Look at me, everyone. Pastors, you want revival in this nation? The first thing this nation has to do is repent. This nation has got to repent. I'm talking from the grassroots all the way up to the White House, friend. This nation has got to repent. This nation is at the place. They will stand. This nation will stand behind a platform to thousands of people. A politician will stand, and because he's in the Bible Belt, he'll say he's born again. And we're so naive, we'll all check, check. And then he's out west in the gay community, and he'll say, it's time to come out of the closet. This is a new day. More freedom for the gays. He's not born again out in California because he's with the gays out there. We're so stupid, friend. We're so naive. This, this nation needs to repent. And I'm asking, here's what I'm asking. I'm asking in this nation, Lord, bring back the judgment that fell on Ananias and Sapphira. Bring it back to this nation where someone stands behind some political platform and starts lying to the man in front of him and lying to God and saying, I'm born again. Vote for me. There'll be prayer back in school. May God strike him. And may preachers say, Senator, that's from Jesus. And his wife comes in, says the same one who carried your husband out will carry you out also. After that happens a few times in this nation, people will realize there's a pattern. They talked about God. They lived an alternative lifestyle. Their lifestyle did not match what they were speaking, and they dropped dead. Duh. <laughs> what should we do? Let's not say we're Christians anymore unless we're really Christians. Here's what we're going to do. They've got the chairs out of the way. Everyone in the other rooms, listen closely. I'm going to give what we call an altar call. This is a time for you to respond. You have got to respond. Those of you that are backslid, the Lord is speaking to you tonight. The rebel's reward was rejection. You don't want that, friend. You don't want God to turn from you and say, because you rejected my word on August 1st, 1996, I'm rejecting you, son. I'm walking the other way. How can you preach like that? Friend, the word is full of preaching like that. Jesus said he'll cut you down. Because you're not bearing forth fruit, he'll cut you down. So tonight, if you're backslidden, you need to give your life back to Jesus. This altar calls for you. If you've never known the Lord, you have never known Jesus as your personal Savior, tonight's the night for you. You're going to come forward. If you're a religious person in this room and you do all the right things, you wear the robe, you, you, you wear the collar, you sing in the choir, you, you serve communion, you take up the offering, you put people in their seats, you Take them to their pews. You help old ladies across the street, but you don't know God, friend. You don't know the Lord. I'm going to tell you, you're going to get a rude awakening because you're going to get up there and you're going to look everywhere for your membership card. It ain't there. God never got it. The only card he has are blood red. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the only membership cards he's got up there, friend. He never saw the Episcopalian, the Assembly of God, the Pentecostal. Never saw him, never will. Either you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb or you're just another religious fool. Don't fall for this nation's deception, friend. This nation thinks it's going to heaven. You know this nation is waking up. Y'all know that? Man, I, we prayed with, we've had 35,000 come to the Lord down here and I've had every walk of life. Had a multi-millionaire saved the other night over here. Ran to the altar, ran to the altar, got saved. He knew, you know? You can pat him on the back, say he's this, say he's that, say he's wonderful, say he's the best social worker in town, say he gives to this, gives to that, gives it. He was dark as sin inside. He knew he was away from God. 
America's waking up. I'm going to give this altar call. When charity begins to sing, everyone in this room, those of you in the other rooms, that's a, time, that's a time that you need to come forward quickly. Do not wait on anybody else. Wait for her to sing. When she starts, well, why do I have to come forward? I want to ask you this question, question one time. Why not? Why? Why not? Why don't you want to come forward? Are you ashamed of the Lord? Are you too prideful? I'm throwing it back in your face, friend. There's sin in your life. This is where you deal with it right down here. I'll deal with it right where I'm at. Yeah, with the devil on one shoulder, another imp on the other. He's chaining you to that pew, friend. He said, if you, you don't need to go down there, you're a good person. Stay right where you're at. We'll talk to God right here. Why do you think the devil's saying that to you? You think the Lord's telling you not to come down here, friend? You think the Lord's telling you, don't you go down there. You think that's Jesus? Forget it, friend. The Lord is saying, come, come. Here's where I'll work in your heart. The devil's saying, you're just fine. You're just fine. Take care of this at home in, this, in the quiet of your own bedroom. You'll get to your bedroom, friend. You'll kneel by your bed. You'll start talking to God, and the heavens will be brass. All you're going to hear is these words, I hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, naked for you, nude for you. People spat on me. People beat me. They whipped me. They nailed me. They scarred my body, and I was sinless. I did it for you. I went all the way to the cross for you. It took me 33 years, but I went all the way to the cross, and you couldn't walk 25 feet. What do you think, friend? That's what you're going to hear in that bedroom. You couldn't walk down to that altar. Friend, as soon as charity begins to sing, if you need forgiveness in this place, if you're away from God up in the balcony, you come as quick as you can. There is plenty of room right now for you to come down. But in a minute, this will be flooded. You need to come down quickly, as quick as you can. Down here, if you need Jesus to forgive you, you need him to wash your sins away, come into your life. I want you to come right now. I need the Lord. Don't be stubborn. Don't be rebellious. Come on. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Hurry. 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 Come on. Hurry. Hurry. In the hurry. Come on. Come on in the balcony. Let's everything go. Everything is come on. unknown. Come on. Come on. I face the Pray, power Pray, of sin on my own. Come on. Get on your knees, I folks. do not Get know. On your knees. Get on your knees. Let's talk to Jesus. Get on your knees. Let's talk to the Lord. Where I could find a way I to be heal no my more. wounded soul. In the choir room. In the cafeteria. Let's go. He saw that I could come into his presence come without fear. Come on. Come on. Into the, the holy place. I need the Lord. His mercy come on. hovers near. Come on. Come on. I'm I need running. Jesus. I need running, Jesus. Come on. I'm running Come on. to the Come on. mercy seat where Jesus is calling. Let the Lord love he on you. He said his grace Let the Lord will love cover on you. me. Come on. His blood will Come on, friends. flow free. Come on. Workers, let's go. will provide the healing. I'm running to the mercy seat. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? I'm running to the mercy seat. Duck. Duck. Get back over there. Come on. Come on.
I want you to hear, friend, every one of you, the altar, stay right where you're at. God's dealing with your heart. But I want you to hear what God hears right now. If you're standing there, there's adultery in your heart. There's rebellion in your heart. There's stubbornness in your heart. If you're standing there, you're a pornographer. You're involved in some illicit sexual affair. If you're standing there, friend, and you are against, there's something between you and God. You are an idolater, friend. This is what the Lord is hearing. I want you to hear it again, friend. He is hearing the pleading. He is hearing that. He is hearing that. He's hearing the pages turn of your pornographic material. He is hearing your obstinance, friend. You come. The Lord is hearing that. He's hearing that. It's in his ears. One more time, Doug. Listen to me, friend. God's hearing everything. This is what he heard Saul was up to. What have you done, Saul? I told you to kill them all. Listen to that, Saul. Now, right now, those of you that are away from God, I want you to get down here right now. 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 If you know you're supposed to be down here, friend, you get down here right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Not me. I'm stubborn. God bless you. I know they're still coming, Pastor. Come on. You don't know when the Lord's going to draw the line, friend. Come on. You don't know when he's going to draw the line. Workers, make sure you let these folks in. We're about to have another wave of people, so you're going to have to make, wave, make room for them. I read something this morning, friend. There is a line by us unseen that crosses every path the hidden boundary that lies between God's patience and his wrath. There's a line. You never know when God's going to cross over that line. Right now, he's patient with you, but there's coming a time, friend. He turned to Saul, and he said, enough is enough. I want everyone in this congregation, those of you at the altar, God hears your cries. You continue but I want everyone in this congregation, I want you to turn to the person next to you. In the balcony, you're going to do this. Don't do it until I tell you what to do. In the other rooms, the overflow rooms, I want you to do this. I know hundreds are coming to God in the other rooms. But here's what we're going to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and you're going to ask them if they need Jesus Christ to forgive them. When someone does that, friend, church, look this way. When they do that and ask you if you need forgiveness, don't be stubborn. Don't be rebellious. Look them in the eyes. If there's sin between you and God and you know your relationship with God is non-existent, look them in the eyes and say, I need forgiveness, man. I'm away from God. Would you be honest? Try that on for size. It'll change your life. Everyone's going to do this in this room. Then both of you, you're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. And then both of you are going to come down. You're not going to lie. If you're away from God, you're not going to lie. Up in the balcony, in the choir room, in the cafeteria, in the WM's room. Everyone do this right now. Turn to the person next to you. Ask them if they need forgiveness. And then bring them down right now. Do not lie. Yes. Yes. Come on. 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 Let's go. Come on. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sis. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Workers, make room for them. They're coming all from behind you. Let them all in. You get behind them. Come on. In the balcony. Come on down. Friends, is there somebody walking by you? Let them get through easily. Come on. In the choir room. Come on. In the WM's room. Let's go. In the cafeteria. Let's go. Come on. Come on. God's brought you here tonight, friend. brought you here. Now in just a minute we're going to pray with these folks. Church, please be patient with us. Please be patient, friend. Some of the folks that come at the very, very end become some of the most dynamic Christians. 
I want to tell you why they have a hard time coming. They're being fought by hell. I want to tell you why they're being fought by hell. Because Satan knows that they're going to do damage. Come on. You ask me, why do some people wait? Why do they hesitate so much? Some people know this is called commitment. They want to make sure they're making a commitment. I love the men coming to this revival, man. We've had thousands of men saved, made a commitment. Pastors, if you could only see the fruit that we've seen, man. You heard it tonight, this one lady saying her family's been saved, her whole life has changed. We've heard that story thousands of times. Thousands of times, just over and over. Commitment. People are making a commitment. Come on. God bless you folks for not being stubborn tonight. I want to tell you, that last portion that I read to you, the rebel's reward, that ain't going to apply to you, friend. You ain't no rebel. You're no rebel. You might have been a rebel 20 minutes ago. You ain't no rebel now. You got a reward coming your way, friend. It's not a curse. It's a crown. God's going to bless you. God's going to bless you. Anybody else? I'm going to close the altar call. I want everyone to bow their heads. Everyone at the altar, bow your heads. Everyone in the overflow rooms that have come to the altar, I want you to bow your heads. We're going to pray a simple prayer. We're going to ask Jesus Christ to forgive us, to wash our sins away, to make us brand new. Some of you have been backslid for years. Others here have never known the Lord. Last night we had so many people that had never known God. They were saved for the first time. So beautiful to see. That may be you. But tonight you may be backslidden. This year you're coming back after years of being away. Whatever your situation, you pray this prayer together with me right now. Everyone at the altar, pray with me out loud. Dear Jesus. No, I want you to pray out loud. Everyone at the altar. Dear Jesus. Thank you for speaking to my heart. I say to you tonight, I am no longer a rebel. I will not be stubborn. I am yielding to you. To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey you is more important than anything else. And tonight, I am obeying you. I have sinned. I have hurt you. And I've hurt others. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me clean. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me, Jesus. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. I give myself to you 100% in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.